quad. Thou goest to women. Do not forget thy hip. And quad. Thus spake Zarathustra. The bite of the adder. One day had Zarathustra fallen asleep under a thick tree, owing to the heat, with his arm over his face. And there came in. Adder and bit him in the neck, so that Zarathustra screamed with pain. When he had taken his arm from his face he looked. The bite of the adder. Zarathustra, and Quad, as 7. As a serpent, and men did it recognize the eyes of Zarathustra, wriggled awkwardly, and tried to get away. And Quad, not at all, said, Yet hast thou not received my thanks. Thou hast awakened me in time. My journey is yet long. And Quad, and Quad, thy journey is short. And Quad, said the adder sadly. And Quad, my poison is fatal. And Quad, Zarathustra smiled. And Quad, when did ever a dragon die of a serpent death? Poison. And Quad, said he. And Quad, but take thy poison back. Thou art not rich enough to present it to me. And Quad, then fell the adder again on his neck, and lit his moon. When Zarathustra once told this to his disciples they asked him, And Quad, and what, O Zarathustra, is the moral of thy story? And Quad, and Zarathustra answered them thus, The destroyer of morality, the good and just call me, my story is immoral. When, however, ye have an enemy, then return him not good for evil, for that would abash him. But prove that he hath done something good to you, and rather be angry than abash anyone. And when ye are cursed, it pleaseth me not that ye should then desire to bless. Rather curse a little also. And should a great injustice befall you, then do quickly five small ones besides. Hideous to behold is he on whom injustice presseth alone. Did ye ever know this? Shared injustice is half justice. And he who can bear it, shall take the injustice upon himself. A small revenge is humaner than no revenge at all. And if the punishment be not also a right and an honor to the transgressor, I do not like your punishing. Nobler is it to own oneself in the wrong than to establish one as right, especially if one be in the right. Only, one must be rich enough to do so. I do not like your cold justice out of the eye of your judges. J2. Thus spake Zax Athustra. Near always glance at the executioner and his cold steel. Tell me, where find we justice, which is love with seeing eyes? Devise me, then, a love which not only bereath all punishment, but also all guilt. Devise me, then, the justice which acquitteth every one except the judge. And would ye hear this likewise? To him who seeketh to be just from the heart, even the lie becometh philanthropy. But how could I be just from the heart? How can I give every one his own? Let this be enough for me. I give unto every one mine own. Finally, my brethren, guard against doing wrong to any anchorite. How could an anchorite forget? How could he requite? Like a deep well is an anchorite. Easy is it to throw in a stone. If it should sink to the bottom, however, tell me, who will bring it out again? Guard against injuring the anchorite. If ye have done so, however, well then, kill him also. Thus spake Zarathustra. 20. 
child and marriage. I have a question for thee alone, my brother, like a sounding weed, cast I this question into thy soul, that I may know its depth. Thou art young, and desirest child in marriage. But I ask thee, art thou a man entitled to desire a child? Child in marriage. 73. Art thou the victorious one, the self-conqueror, the ruler of thy passion, the master of thy virtues? Thus do I ask thee, or did the animal speak in thy wish, and necessity, or isolation, or discord in me? I would have thy victory and freedom long for a child. Living monuments shalt thou build to thy victory and emancipation. Beyond thyself shalt thou build. But first of all must thou be built thyself, rectangular in body and soul. Not only onward shalt thou propagate thyself, but upward. For that purpose may the garden of marriage help thee. A higher body shalt thou create, a first movement, a spontaneously rolling wheel of creating one shalt thou create. Marriage. So call I the will of the twain to create the one that is more than those who created it. The reverence for one end. Other, as those exercising such a will, call I marriage. Let this be the significance and the truth of thy marriage. But that which the many too many call marriage, those super theos ones off, what shall I call it? Ah, the poverty of soul and the twain. Ah, the filth of soul and the twain. Ah, the pitiable self-complacency in the twain. Marriage they call it all, and they say their marriages are made in heaven. Well, I do not like it, that heaven of the superfluous. No, I do not like them, those animals tangled in the heavenly coils. Far from me also be the God who limpeth thither to bless what he hath not matched. Laugh not at such marriages. What child hath not had reason to weep over its parents? Worthy did this man seem, and ripe for the meaning of the earth. But when I saw his wife, she and Tilda Tilda art seemed to me a home. For madcaps. 74. Thus spake Zarathustra. Yea, one would that the earth should be convulsions when a Saint Anna and Goose mate with one another. This one went forth in quest of truth as a hero, and at last got for himself a small decked up lie, his marriage he called it. That one was reserved in intercourse and chose choicely. Rut. One time he spoiled his company for all time, his marriage he called it. Another sought a handmaid with the virtues of an angel. But all at once he became the handmaid of a woman, and now would he need also to become an angel. Careful, have I found all buyers, and all of them have astute eyes. But even the astutest of them buyeth his wife in a sack. Many short follies that is called love by you. And your marriage putteth an end to many short follies, with one long stupidity. Your love to woman, and woman's love to man off, who did it were sympathy for suffering and veiled deities. But generally two animals alight on one another. But even your best love is only an enraptured simile and a painful ardor. It is a torch to light you the loftier paths. Beyond yourselves shall ye love some day. Then learn first of all to love. And on that account he had to bring the bitter cup of your love. Bitterness is in the cup even of the best love. Thus did it cause longing for the superman, thus did it cause thirst in. B. The creating one. Thirst in the creating one, arrow and longing for the superman, 
tell me, my brother, is this thy way to marriage? Holy call I such a will, and such a marriage. Thus spake Zarathustra. Voluntary death. 21. Voluntary death. 75. Many die too late, and some die too early. Yet strange soundeth the precept, and cloth, die at the right time. And cloth, die at the right time, so teacheth Zarathustra. To be sure, he who never liveth at the right time, how coiild he ever die at the right time? Would that he might never be born. Thus do I advise the superfluous ones. But even the superfluous ones make much ado about the e death, and even the hollowest nut wanteth to be cracked. Everyone regardeth dying as a great matter, but as yet death is not a festival. Not yet have people learned to inaugurate the finest festivals. The consummating death I show unto you, which becometh a stimulus and promise to the living. His death, dieth the consummating one triumphantly, surrounded by hoping and promising ones. Thus should one learn to die, and there should be no festival, at which such a dying one does not consecrate the oaths of the living. Thus to die is best, the next best, however, is to die in battle, and sacrifice a great soul. But to the fighter equally hateful as to the victor, is your grinning death which stealeth nigh like a thief, and yet cometh as master. My death, praise I unto you, the voluntary death, which cometh unto me with the seven wanted. And when shall I want it? He that hath a goal and an heir, wanteth death at the right time for the goal and the heir. And plot, J6. Thus spake Zarathustra. And out of reverence for the goal and the heir, he will hang up no more withered wreaths in the sanctuary of life. Verily, not the rope makers will I resemble, they lengthen out their cord, and thereby go ever backward. Many a one, also, waxeth too old for his truths and triumphs, a toothless mouth hath no longer the right to every truth. And whoever wanteth to have fame, must take leave of honor betimes, and practice the difficult art of going at the right time. One must thus continue being feasted upon when one tasketh best, that is known by those who want to be long loved. Sour apples are there, no doubt, whose lot is to wait until the last day of autumn, and at the same time they become ripe, yellow, and shriveled. In some again the heart first, and in others the spirit. And some are hoary in youth, but the late young keep long young. To many men life is a failure, a poison worm gnaweth at their heart. Then let them see to it that their dying is all the more a success. Many never become sweet, they rot even in the summer. It is cowardice that holdeth them fast to their branches. Far too many live, and far too long hang they on their branches. Would that a storm came and shook all this rotten. Ness and worm eat tennis from the tree. Would that there came creatures of speedy death. Those would be the appropriate storms and agitators of the trees of life. But I hear only slow death preach, and patience with all. That is in quad, earthly, and quad. Ah, we preach patience with what is earthly. This earthly is it that hath too much patience with me, me blasphemers. Voluntary death. Seven verily, too early died the Hebrew whom the preachers of slow death honor, and to many hath it proved the calamity Taihe died too early. As 
yet had he known only tears, and the melancholy of the Hebrews, together with the hatred of the good and just the Hebrew Jesus, then was he seized with the longing for death. Had he but remained in the wilderness, and far from the good and just, then, perhaps, would he have learned to live, and love the earth and laughter also. Believe it, my brethren, he died too early, he himself would have disavowed his doctrine had he attained to my age. Noble, enough was he to disavow, but he was still immature, immaturely loveth the youth, and immaturely also hateth he man and earth. Confined and awkward are still his soul and the wings of his spirit. But in man there is more of the child than in the youth, and less of melancholy, better understandeth he about life and death. Free for death, and free in death, a holy naysayer, when there is no longer time for yea, thus understandeth he about death and life. That your dying may not be a reproach to man and the earth, my friend, that do I solicit from the honey of your soul. In your dying shall your spirit and your virtue still shine like an evening after glow around the earth, otherwise your dying hath been unsatisfactory. Thus will I die myself, that ye friends may love the earth more for my sake, and earth will I again become, to have rest in her that bore me. J.A. Thus spake Zarathustra. Verily, a bull had Zarathustra, he threw his ball. Now he may friends the heirs of my gold, he throw at a golden ball. Best of all, do I see you, my friends, throw the golden ball. And so tarry I still a little while on the earth, pardon me for it. Thus spake Zarathustra. 22. The Bestowing Virtue When Zarathustra had taken leave of the town to which his heart was attached, the name of which is in Quat, the Pied Cow, and Quat, there followed him many people who called themselves his disciples, and kept him company. Thus came they to a crossroads. Then Zarathustra told them that he now wanted to go alone, for he was fond of going alone. His disciples, however, presented him at his departure with a staff, on the golden handle of which a serpent twined round the sun. Zarathustra rejoiced on account of the staff, and supported himself thereon. Then spake he thus to his disciples, Tell me, pray, how came gold to the highest value? Because it is uncommon, and unprofiting, and deeming, and soft in luster, it always bestoweth itself. Only as image of the highest virtue came gold to the highest value. Gold-like, beneath the glance of the bestower. Gold lustre maketh peace between moon and sun. And am, lt, s. Uncommon is the highest virtue, and unfrifting, heaming, hid, and soft of luster, of bestowing virtue is the highest virtue. The bestowing virtue. 79 Verily, I divine you well, my disciples, ye strive like me for the bestowing virtue. What should ye have in common with cats and wolves? It is your thirst to become sacrifices and gifts yourselves, and till your cord of ye the thirst to accumulate ale riches in your soul. Insatiably striveth your soul for treasures and jewels, because your virtue is insatiable in desiring to bestow. Ye constrain all things to flow towards you and into you, so that they shall flow back again out of your fountain as the gifts of your love. 
Verily, an appropriator of all values must such bestowing love become, with healthy and holy, call I this selfishness. Another selfishness is there, an all too poor and hungry kind, which would always steal the selfishness of the sick, the sickly selfishness. With the eye of the thief it looketh upon all that is lustrous, with the craving of hunger it measureth him who hath at him dance, and ever does it prowl round the tables of the stowers. Sickness speaketh in such craving, and invisible degenerateon, of a sickly body, speaketh the larcenous craving of this. Selfishness. Tell me, my brother, what do we think bad, and worst of all? Is it not the generation? And we always suspect degenerateon when the bestowing soul is lacking. Upward goeth our course from genera on to super genera. But the horror to us is the degenerating sense, which Sidon, and Quas, all. For myself, and Quas. Upward soareth our sense. Thus is it a simile of our body, a simile of an ill, a carrot ion. Such similes of elevations are the names of the virtues. Thus goeth the body through history, of the comer and fighter. 80. Thus spake Zarathustra. And the spirit what is it to the body? Its fights and victories herald, its companion and echo. Similes, are all names of good and evil. They do not speak out, they only hint. A fool who seeketh knowledge from them. Give he, my brethren, to every hour when your spirit would speak in simile, there is the origin of your virtue. Elevated is then your body, and raised up, with its delight, enraptureth is the spirit, so that it becometh creator, and valuer, and lover, and everything as benefactor. When your heart overfloweth broad and full like the river, a blessing and a danger to the lowlanders, there is the origin of your virtue. When ye are exalted above praise and blame, and your will would command all things, as a loving one as will, there is the origin of your virtue. When ye despise pleasant things, and the effeminate couch, and cannot couch far enough from the effeminate, there is the origin of your virtue. When ye are willers of one will, and when the change of every need is needful to you, there is the origin of your virtue. Verily, a new good and evil is it. Verily, a new deep murmuring, and the voice of a new fountain. Power is it, this new virtue, the ruling God is it, and around it a subtle soul, a golden sun, with the serpent of knowledge around it. Here paused Zarathustra a while, and looked lovingly on his disciples. Then he continued to speak thus and his voice had changed. The bestowing virtue, 8L. Remain true to the earth, my brethren, with the power of your virtue. Let your bestowing love and your knowledge be devoted to be the meaning of the earth. Thus do I pray and conjure you. Let it not fly away from the earthly and beat against eternal walls with its wings. Ah, there hath always been so much flown away virtue. Let, like me, the flown away virtue back to the earth, yea. Back to body and life, that it may give to the earth its meaning, a human meaning. A hundred times hitherto hath spirit as well as virtue flown. Away in blunder, alas. In our body dwelleth still all this delusion and blundering, body and who hath it there become. A hundred times hitherto hath spirit as well as virtue is tempted and air. Yea, an attempt hath man been. Alas, 
much ignorance and error hath become embodied in us. Not only the rationality of millennia also their mad. Yes, break it out in us. Dangerous is it to be in air. Still fight we step by step with the giant chance, and over all mankind hath hitherto ruled nonsense, for lack of sense. Let your spirit and your virtue be devoted to the sense of the earth, my brethren, let the value of everything be determined anew by you. Therefore shall ye be fighters, therefore shall ye be creators. Intelligently did the body purify itself, attempting with intelligence it exalted itself. The discerners all impulses sanctify themselves, to the exalt of the soul becometh joyful. Physician, heal thyself, then wilt thou also heal thy patient. Let it be his best care to see with his eyes him who maketh himself whole. A thousand paths are there which have never yet been trodden, a thousand celebrities and hidden islands of light. 82. Thus SPAKFFC Zarathustra. Unexhausted and undiscovered is still man and man's world. Awake and hearken, ye lonesome ones. From the future come winds with stealthy pinions, and to fine years the tidings are proclaimed. Ye lonesome ones of today, ye seceding ones, ye shall one day be a people. Out of you who have chosen yourselves, shall a chosen people arise, and out of it the superman. Verily, a place of healing shall the earth become. And already is a new odor diffused around it, a salvation bringing exor and a new hope. When Zarathustra had spoken these words, he paused, like one who had not said his last word, and long did he balance the staff doubtfully in his hand. At last he spake thus and his voice had changed, I now go alone, my disciples. Ye also now go away, and alone, so will I have it. Verily, I advise you, depart from me, and guard yourselves against Zarathustra. And better still, be ashamed of him, perhaps he hath deceived you. The man of knowledge must be able not only to love his enemies, but also to hate his friends. One reputeth a teacher badly if one remain merely a scholar. And why will ye not pluck at my wreath? Ye venerate me, but what if your veneration should some? They collapse, take heed lest a statue crush you. Ye say, ye believe in Zarathustra. But of what account is Zarathustra? Ye are my believers, but of what account are all? Believers. The bestowing virtue. 83. You had not yet sought yourselves. Then did ye find me. So do all believers. Therefore all grief is of so little account. Now that I bid you lose me and find yourselves, and only when ye have all denied me, will I return unto you. Verily, with other eyes, my brethren, shall I then seek him lost one, with another love shall I then love you. And once again shall ye have become friends unto me, and children of one hope, then will I be with you for the third Tim and Am, LT, to celebrate the great new tide with you. And it is the great new tide. When man is in the middle of his course between animal and superman, and celebrateth his advance to the evening is his highest hope, for it is the advance to a new morning. At such time will the downgoer bless himself, that he should be an overgoer, and the sun of his knowledge will be at noontide. And quad, dead are all the gods, now do we desire the superman to live.
Let this be our final rule of the great noontide. Thus spake Zarathustra. Spake Zarathustra. Second part. And quad. And only when ye have all beneath me, will I return unto you. Verily, with other eyes, my brethren, shall I then seek my lost ones, with another love shall I then love you, and quad. Zarathustra, I, and quad, the bestowing virtue and quad, he. 92. 23. The child with the mirror. After this Zarathustra returned again into the mountains TX the solitude of his cave, and withdrew himself from men, waiting like a sower who hath scattered his seed. His soul, however, became impatient and full of longing for those whom he loved, because he had still much to give them. For this is hardest of all, to close the open hand out of love, and keep modest as a giver. Thus passed with the loans of one month and year.
new paths do I tread, a new speech cometh unto me, tired have I become like all creators of the old times. No longer will my spirit walk on worn out souls. Too slowly runneth all speaking for me, into thy chariot, O storm, do I leap. And even thee will I whip with my spite. Like a cry and a puzzle will I traverse wide seas, till I find the happy isles where my friends sojourn, and mine enemies amongst them. How I now love every one unto whom I may but speak. Even mine enemies pertain are oh my bliss. And when I want to mount my wildest horse, then did my spear always help me up best. It is my foot as ever ready. Servant, the spear which I hurl at mine enemies. How grateful am I to mine enemies that I may at last hurl it. Too great hath been the tension of my cloud, twixt laugh. Tears of lightning will I cast hail showers into the depths. Violently will my breast then heat. Violently will it blow its storm over the mountains. Thus cometh its assuagement. Verily, like a storm cometh my happiness, and my freedom. But mine enemies shall think that the evil one yoreth over their heads. Yea, me also, my friends, will be alarmed by my wild wisdom, and perhaps he will flee therefrom, along with mine enemies. Ah, that I knew how to lure you back with shepherd's food. Ah, that my lioness wisdom would learn to roar softly. And much have we already learned with one another. My wild wisdom became pregnant on the lonesome mound. 90. Thus spake Zarathustra. Tame, on the rough stones did she bear the youngest of her young. Now runneth she foolishly in the arid wilderness and seeketh and seeketh the soft sword mine old, wild wisdom. On the soft sword of your hearts, my friends, on your love, which she fain couch her dearest wine. Thus spake Zarathustra. 24. In the happy isles, the figs fall from the trees, they are good and sweet, and in falling the red skins of them break. A north wind am I to write. Fig. Thus, like fig, do these doctrines fall for you, my friends, imbibe now their juice and their sweet substance. It is autumn all around, and clear sky, and afternoon. Lo, what fullness is around us, and out of the midst of superabundance. It is delightful to look out upon distant seas. Once did people say God, when they looked out upon distant seas. Now, however, have I taught you to say, Superman. God is a conjecture, but I do not wish your conjecturing to reach beyond your creating will. Can ye create a God? Then, I pray you, be silent about all gods. But ye could well create the Superman. Not perhaps ye yourselves, my brethren. But into fathers and forefathers of the Superman could ye transform yourselves. And let that be your best creating. In the Happy Isles. 91. God is a conjecture. But I should like your conjecturing restricted to the conceivable. Can ye conceive a God? But let this mean will to truth unto you, that everything be transformed into the humanly conceivable, the humanly visible, the humanly sensible. Your own discernment shall ye follow out to the end, and what ye have called th and am, lt. World shall but be created by you. Your reason, your likeness, your will, your love, shall it itself become. And verily, for your bliss, ye discerning ones, 
And how will be in their life without that hope? Be discerning ones. Neither in the inconceivable would need have been born, nor in the irrational. But that I may reveal my heart entirely unto you, my friends, there were gods, how could one endure it to be no god? Therefore there are no gods. Nay, I have drawn the conclusion. Now, however, does it draw me? God is a conjecture, but who could drink all the bitterness of this conjecture without dying? Shall his faith be taken from the creating one, and from the evil his flights into evil heights? God is a thought that maketh all the straight crooked, and all that standeth real. What? Time would be gone, and all the perishable would be but a lie. To think this is giddiness and vertigo to human limbs, and even vomiting to the stomach, verily, the reeling sickness do. I call it, to conjecture such a thing. Evil do I call it and misanthropic. All the teaching about the one, and the plenum, and the unmoved, and the sufficient and the imperishable. All the imperishable that is but a simile, and the poets lie too much. He too. Thus spake Zarathustra. But O T time and of the coming shall the best similes speak. A. Praise shall they be, and a justification of all perishableness. Creating that is the great salvation from suffering, and life as alleviation. But for the Creator to appear, suffering itself is needed, and much transformation. Yea, much bitter dying must there be in your lives, ye Creators. Thus are ye advocates and justifiers of all perishableness. For the Creator Himself to be the newborn child, he must also be willing to be the child-bearer, and endure the pangs of the child-bearer. Verily, through a hundred souls went I my way, and through a hundred cradles and birth throes. Many a farewell have I taken, I know the heart-breaking last hours. But so will it that my creating will, my faith. For, to tell you it more candidly, just such a fate willeth my will. All feeling suffereth in me, and is in prison, but my willing ever cometh to me as mine emancipator and comforter. Willing emancipated, that is the true doctrine of will and emancipation so teacheth you Zarathustra. No longer willing, and no longer valuing, and no longer creating. Ah, that that great ability may ever be far from me. And also in discerning.